and welcome back to <gasps> the physiology is saying and saying and saying and yeah hey what's up all right so hopefully this will be a little shorter partly because i'm getting over a cold my voice is actually getting a little tired because i haven't drank enough water today and also getting over a cold um <clears throat> but hopefully you just enjoyed the 30 minute long root of the tongue video, which I know is a long one, but uh, for the really useful information, skip ahead to like the 12 minute mark. Um, but as I said there, we're gonna do the front, the little, the other ex sections of the tongue, the one that are more involved with vowels, okay? It's gonna spill over into root of the tongue, so I recommend starting with that one. That's probably a better one to start with. Um, it's gonna spill over a bit, but ugh, right, left, here we go. There we are, let's think about this. So we're gonna get into more of what's the tip, the blade, and the dorsum, okay? This area of the tongue. Um, because I'm gonna be talking a little bit about vowels. And for the science-minded folks out there, yes, your root of the tongue is definitely involved with a lot of this stuff. But for the sake of parsing it out and making it simpler conceptually for singers, I'm gonna talk about them a little separately because I think that's a more useful way to focus on it um, for purposes of technique. Okay, so, all right, um, so, uh, to review a little bit, not going into muscles of the tongue, because the tongue acts like a muscular hydrostat, which essentially means it behaves a lot like a water balloon that you've tied off, um, meaning if you squeeze one section, so essentially muscles or a combination of muscles or one area of a few muscles will contract, and that will, like, cause other parts of the tongue to bulge out, okay? And that's how your tongue makes all its different shapes, even this one, okay? So it's like a super flexible water balloon, all right? Super flexible. Um, you know, so yeah, but yeah, it's like if you squeeze on a water balloon and, you know, one part is going to bulge out. So tongue works that way. All right. Um, so I'm not going to get any of the muscles because that's just not how your brain tends to concept, you know, like tell your tongue to work. And really, as a singer, I just think if somebody had told me to contract, you know, well, your hyoglossus, if, if I heard that come out of voice teacher, I'd be like, oh, okay, this is one of those, like, I don't know which muscle is my hyoglossus, I don't know how I sense my hyoglossus, but I'm just going to take a better breath, and hopefully I give you what you want, right? So, uh, as a singer, you got to do that, especially if you're going to be professional. You have to do the smile and nod, Yeah! And just have an idea of what the person's talking about. And I feel like, especially when you get into the tongue stuff, that's really what it's about, is like, they're talking about something nuanced, they're talking about vocal quality or something, and you just gotta figure out, what are they talking about? <laughs> and, and can I fix it with like my next inhale for myself? That's like what you need to know, right? You need to kind of dumb it down a little bit, just so that it's something manageable for you to do in that moment, right? All right, so, um, Pure vowels, oh, so that's a phrase. It's hard to define what the heck pure vowels actually means. So from a purely scientific acoustics standpoint, there's no such thing as pure vowels. The acoustic signal is the acoustic signal. It, it is as it does. Sound is as sound does, folks. Um, so your tongue is gonna, you know, make, it's gonna kind of, um, it's gonna, essentially pinch off certain areas of your vocal tract and that creates a different resonance pattern and then you get different vowels out of that and people hear it as a different thing and you know but there's a lot of studies out there of listeners listening to people talk and they've discovered a lot that listeners perceive vowels differently based off of what came before it what they expected to hear linguistic effects like i expect to hear this word so if it's not that word i'm not going to hear the right vowel all this kind of stuff, okay? There's crazy stuff out there. So if you're talking to someone who's in linguistics and if you're talking to someone who is in what's called speech perception or speech acoustics or is a speech scientist of any kind and you ask them about pure vowels as a singer, they're gonna go, there are no pure vowels. Nine times out of 10. I guess linguistics maybe. Maybe some of them might have arguments about that, but I don't know. I was never in linguistics, so I don't really know the nuances of what they're getting into with that. Um, <laughs> But as a singer, as a, especially as an opera singer, and as a young opera singer trying to figure it all out, 
it means something. People talk about pure vowels all the time, and they talk to you if your vowels aren't pure. Oh, that's, that's not a pure Italian A vowel right there. And you're like, oh, okay, you know. And the thing that always confused me the most about it as a young singer is um, I found, and maybe I'm the only one, but I highly doubt I am. Um, I found that, you know, what somebody might, what vowel they might pick on really depended on the person, right? There were some coaches who were really about the ooh or really about the e, and then there were other coaches who were really about my ah and like really nitpicky about what kind of ah I produced. Or they're both equally picky about the ah, but one likes it a little brighter than the other one. One likes it maybe a little closer to an eh, and the other one doesn't. And they're both telling you it's Italianate. You're working the same aria with both. Eh, and you just didn't know exactly what to do, but you just like file it away in your brain to be like, okay, that's the vowel I do with this person, I guess. And then I'll split the difference for a performance. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'll do whatever feels better, I guess. Um, you know? And so, you know, I think it can get a little sticky and it can get hard to figure out. Um, I was at a master class at, when I was in speech pathology, when I was uh, starting the PhD there. I went to a master class where somebody was picking apart this girl's vowels, her Italianate vowels were not Italianate. Um, and he was right. She wasn't producing very good Italian vowels. And it was a Bellini aria that I knew pretty well, so um, I knew what she should have been saying. And she wasn't. She wasn't getting the words. Her diction was lacking. And she was an undergraduate voice major, so, you know, that happens to us all, of course. And at this point, my diction is so lacking because I have no training at this point. I don't even know what. Like, pff, I mean, I would probably be so embarrassed going in front of a coach anyway because uh, I probably think I'm sounding good. And they'd be like, no. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, it's been a few years. <laughs> gotten rusty um but uh so what I think was happening with this particular student is the net effect was essentially you couldn't distinguish her vowels well enough and as a as an acoustics as someone into speech acoustics especially at the time I was very into speech acoustic I was reading articles about it, analyzing acoustic signals using software, like doing all kinds of stuff with acoustics, acoustics, acoustics. And I was like really trying to figure out what is this masterclass technician, this, this metropolitan opera singer telling this person to do when it comes to when they talk about pure vowels? What are they saying? Okay. And I was coming at it from that standpoint of a scientist being like, I know there's not really such a thing as a pure vowel acoustically like in the world of speech we don't think of vowels that way we either think of it as like would someone hear that correctly or not <laughs> right if i say e if i say oh i'm coming and i say i are they going to hear the diphthong and hear that i said the word i that's all we're mainly concerned about and yes there's different acoustic signatures for that but there's there's some leeway within it right there's a little there's wiggle room within how listeners hear the right word, even if it's just a vowel combination like I, okay? <laughs> All right. Um, or he, he went to the store or something like, you know, right? Or you were away. Okay. That's like essentially a lot of vowels other than the er. Um, so, right. So there's some leeway. Uh, in how we perceive that in speech. And speech moves really fast, so we're interested in transitions and all of this. In singing, we're sustaining the vowels. So that's one thing that's different than speech acoustics. We're sustaining the vowels for a lot longer, okay? So if I want to say mi chiamo no mimi, you know, mi chiamo no mimi, like I'm saying mi, mi, like I'm not, that's way slower than I would say the word, right? Um, <laughs> Mi chiama no mi mi, right? Like it's super slow if you're trying to talk it in rhythm. It's always awkward, right? Because it's like, this is really slow. Um, so I think that's one reason we get uh, particularly obsessed with hearing, perceiving. So the person listening to you singing, what they want to hear is the right vowel. So if you're saying mi mi, they want to hear mi mi. They don't want to hear me me or me me. Or me, me. They don't want to hear any variation. They want to hear me, me. They want to hear an E vowel. 
right? So that means to make a really nice clear E vowel, um, the tip of the tongue is back behind your teeth and the rest of the tongue is humped up and essentially it's getting very close to the roof of your mouth right behind your upper teeth. Your alveolar ridge, ee, 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 it's right up there, okay? Um, that creates a nice clear E vowel, is that frontal part of the tongue right there. That like part really has to be in that position. Otherwise, you might be getting more of an I or an E or an I. You might pucker out a little and have like a French mixed vowel, which you wouldn't want to have in Italian. Okay. Um, at least not when you're saying Mimi, because her name is not Mimi. <laughs> so Mimi. Okay. Um, so, or people don't call her Mimi. That'd be, I guess it'd be a totally different opera. Mimi. What's up, Mimi? Okay, anyway. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm going to stop myself from making stupid jokes. Okay. Um, yeah, so front of the tongue, involved with a lot of that stuff, how it is shaped has a lot to do with how those vowels come out really clearly. And I'm going to really talk about E and U because those are very extreme vowels in the sense of vowel world. E is made with the tongue very forward in the mouth. The tip of the tongue and the blade of the tongue is very forward and it's high. And the rest of your tongue is mostly just hanging out. So you actually have a lot of space back behind that little hump of a tongue. You got a lot of pharyngeal space back there. So it actually creates kind of a dark sound, but what you hear in your head when you sing any e is the ugliest, like witchiest, meh, like naggiest sound. Ugh, I hate it. Everybody hates an evil when they hear the sound in their head. When it comes to just how it sounds when you produce it, me, 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 me. It's like, eh, it sounds so awful. But, so I think that's one vowel where if I hear a young singer singing and they're not making a real E vowel, okay? If they're singing qui la voce and it's like, qui la voce, okay? <laughs> and they're just trying to like wipe it all out, wipe that E out, okay? Um, it's because it sounds so bad in their head. They must, they must think, and I know I did this when I first started singing like, like what we would traditionally call a real, a pure e vowel. You think it sounds horrible. You think there's no way this sounds good. This is no way how I was supposed to sing it. I'm not supposed to sing me, me, like meh, right? So you want to make it sound good in your head. Meh, 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 meh. You want to say like a meh, meh, or like a meh. Want to darken it a little bit and like pucker a little or something to make it less obnoxious essentially and then you'll walk into that master class and the person the one i was re referencing she was singing something else completely she was singing a bellini aria not qui la voce um but she was singing something and it was just like maybe it wasn't bellini maybe it was rossini mm, it's been a few years can't quite recall but um you know and you know, I'm sitting there in the audience and I'm hearing like a meh meh and I'm like, what? They're not singing a real, they're not singing the right vowel. They're not singing the word. They're not singing the word I'm expecting. You know, they're singing que la voce, not qui la voce. I'm expecting qui la voce. I don't, I don't want que la voce. Okay? <laughs> you know, I'm in the audience. I want to hear qui la voce. Right? Um... And I think that's really the, the long and the short of it, is essentially when someone says you're not singing pure vowels, they mean I don't hear the right words because I'm not hearing the right vowels for the words. I'm not hearing an E where I expect to hear an E. I'm not hearing an OO where I expect to hear an OO. I might be hearing an UH. And that is the nemesis of all sopranos right there, right? Is the UH versus the AH. Uh, how many times? Especially as a coloratura. You come down from way up high where you have essentially no vowels happening up there because you're way above the treble clef. Ain't no one going to hear a vowel up there. You might have the shadow of like an E or something up there, but you're not really sick. You're like, you know, you just have this wide open mouth happening. Like, ah. Okay. Way up there and you come down on your scale and now somebody says, well, now you're singing, uh, and you're like, man, 
because you got to refresh the vowel because you've come back down into vowel land, right? You've you've gone from the heavens of your voice, the ceiling, down into vowel land, and now they expect to hear an ah. They expect that to end on an ah, and you're like, ah, shoot, right? <laughs> I was singing uh, <clears throat> right? Uh, and that usually is where, like, for me, a lot of times the biggest tip was to sing like an ah, like come down to essentially what I think of as kind of an ah shape because that's probably an uh, an ah. I probably won't be an uh in schwa land, in neutral land. <laughs> so that's the biggest thing. And the thing about the pure vowels that I think is the obsession over listening for pure vowels when you're in master classes and coachings and voice lessons, me as a teacher, what I'm hearing, if I hear someone do a funky vowel, what I'm hearing is them probably doing something to their vo vocal sound, excuse me, something to their vocal sound that's not going to help them long term. So if you're doing that over covering thing, if the root of your tongue is being pulled back so much, like you have so much root of the tongue tension that you can't sing an E because the front of your tongue isn't free enough to go up there, right? Um, yeah, that's not where it's supposed to be, but I'm over darkening and now I'm cutting off my sound. Um, and the fact that I can't make a pure vowel is a sign that something's wrong. I can't bring that E forward without throwing off my entire vocal sound. So like if the vocal quality dramatically shifts when that person changes and makes a pure vowel, then that tells me as the listener, oh, that person's used to over darkening or that person's using the base of their tongue for something. They're doing something that requires that base of the tongue to be so active that the front of their tongue's not free enough to do the vowels it needs to do. So uh, I think that's the, the, in, the long and the short of it is. Pure vowels, if you hear someone say, that's not a pure vowel, check. Like I say, and this is what I told my students, check down a level, like how's my larynx doing? How is, do I feel like I have effort in my throat happening when I sing that phrase on that vowel? Do I feel like maybe it takes more air to get through it than it should? Because that could be a sign that, oh yes, I was totally pulling the base of the tongue back. I totally had, my laryngeal function was not quite optimal. And if I go back to do something like a straw phonation or a really nice, a, a buzzy sound or something, does that ease it up? And if it does ease it up, now I should just think about keeping that really easy. And I always like to say this to my students after they train with me through for a while, I always like to say, this was like my big concept. And I don't know if this will help anybody out there, but this really helped me. So once I get the feeling of ease, okay, so if I do like a, you know, okay, yeah, it feels like a small little sliver of sound coming out of here, okay? Okay, that's what I need. I need that small sliver, right? I want it to be like kind of that easy, nothing happening there, right? So once I get that feeling, what I want to do is take an inhale and I want to think from here down, like from here back and from here down, it's all part of the larynx. Meaning, I don't want a sensation that I'm having to change a lot, okay? So I have these like zones of where I feel like it needs to stay very stable while I sing. And 100% God honest truth, in reality, it's probably not staying very stable at all. There's a lot of adjustment probably happening throughout the whole thing. But for what I can sense, what I perceive in my body, what I feel is moving around and what I feel I need to focus on as a singer, I think, okay, I'm going to take a big relaxed inhale. And then I'm going to think, okay, from here, like this stuff is all very stable. The breath is very stable because I've got my muscles of inhalation working. That's going to stabilize my larynx a bit. This is going to stay stable. And then from here forward, just like essentially from the back of my teeth forward, that's where I'm going to do my words. That's what moves around a lot. It moves around a lot and moves around fast because I'm doing my words and I'm making my vowels and all of that, doing the consonants, all that jazz. But all the rest, 
And that includes root of the tongue. I'm gonna think about it like that's part of my throat and whatever's part of my throat, it's gonna stay pretty stable. Like I'm not gonna have a sense that I have to do anything with it, right? Once I take that nice inhale and really set things up. So that's how I parse those two things out. So in my mind, it seemed to help a lot when I thought about root of the tongue as being part of my throat, therefore more stable. And it's not something I'm gonna fiddle a lot with. I'm not gonna like fiddle with it and try to optimize it. I'm just gonna take an inhale, get that space, and remember that going through my vocal folds is a tiny little stream of air, so, so the sound through there, you know, I don't need to drive a ton of air through my throat. I just need just enough, right? Just enough. That's the game you play. It's like, okay, I just need just enough air going through there. I need to hold it back with my muscles of inhalation, which is that appoggio thing, leaning on the breath a bit. Get that tall space in there, okay? And then if I wanna sing a passage, it's all here, okay? And I am way out of practice, so I don't even know if this concept still even works right now, but let me just sing like a passage just to see. What the heck, right? Let's proof is in the pudding, I guess. Ah, okay, so. <clears throat> uh, I don't know what I'm saying. Um, okay, let's do this. Uh, let's do the trill first, okay? Okay, I need a better breath, but that's what I suspected. When I'm out of practice, the breath goes first, man. Oh, jeez, so hard to get a big one. Okay. Mm. I'm getting over the cold still. It's kind of husky in there, but... Anyway, that's the idea, okay? So, I need to breathe better. Okay, so like, that's how I would do that, okay? So I'm thinking this stuff is all related to my breathing. It's Stable, it's airflow and breathing, baby. Like just a little airflow and nice controlled inhalation and get those muscle of inhalation really working, which my muscles of inhalation are complete right now because I haven't used them to sing in a while. And um, <laughs> and then I can free up the front of my tongue to do the words. That's the idea. And I apologize. Like I said, that is me literally using that concept after, God, how long has it been since I sang an aria? Whatever the last video was that I put up here that was an aria, that was the last time I physically sang an aria at this point in my life. Like, it's been months. I've been deacon around singing belt and stuff in home, you know, or whatever, but I have not been singing arias. And I have not been practicing arias at all. And I haven't had a voice lesson in well over a year at this point. Year and a half, probably. About a year and a half or so. Okay, so months of no practice getting over a cold, all of that. If you thought that sounded halfway decent, then it worked, <laughs> okay? And please excuse any really awful diction I had because I tried to make it clear, but mm, I might have broken some diction rules, which just means I'm way out of practice when it comes to that. And I know I am. I'm definitely out of practice with that. Been too busy being a clinician, y'all. Clinician and trying to get back into research a bit, so. I eat. So that was that for the pure vowels and the front of the tongue, just trying to relate those two concepts together. Um, I think I'm going to make a separate video on vowel formants because I know that is something that singers and uh, pedagogy folks really talk about a fair amount. And that is, I think, kind of another talk. Um, I mean, it relates to this pure vowel idea that really the proof is in what somebody hears you do as a singer, so someone who is in the position to make decisions about casting or whatever, someone who's coaching singers, someone who really knows their stuff, if they don't hear the right words, then that's not it. Oh, one more caveat to this. This is about solo singing, of course. So when you go into choir, brief caveat about choral singing when it comes to pure vowels. I think a lot of younger singers, you kind of get this idea that E, like that vowel, you kind of tend to darken it, make it more I, more rounded and, and rich sounding. 
a lot of times if you were in high school choir, you had to do that in choir, right? You do that in choir all the time. You don't go E, you go E, E, I'm in choir, E, okay? And, <laughs> and that's because in choir, you're the, the, the choral director, it's not that they don't know about vowels, it just means that they want something different. So an E vowel is really resonant, it's very bright, and it creates, if you really get a nice pure one, it's very freeing. The voice is very free, the resonance is just woo, flying out there. Um, it keeps the, the larynx, if you have a nice easy voice production with a nice pure E, man, it's a nice sound you produce, really. You don't like it in your head, but it sounds good outside and it feels good to do it, too. But it's very, especially for the soloist in the choir, if you're that, so, that strong solo voice, it's really hard to blend that sound. You're going to stick out like a sore thumb. And so louder, stronger voices will stick out on vowels like that, okay, particularly. So the rounding helps you to blend with other people. So if you're working as a soloist, but you also have to take choir at the same time, or maybe you're doing choral singing for a paycheck, um, go ahead and do a pure E with your tongue, and then maybe just round it a bit with your lips or something, you know, or consciously do a different vowel, but consciously. Don't think you're doing an E. Just think, okay, I'm going to do more of an I. All right, I'll do more of an I. That'll make him happy, you know, that'll make her happy. Sure, 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 that'll make the director happy, okay? Um, but yeah, so that's the idea, is that if you're doing choral singing at the same time, blending the voices together to create a unified sound is really the target and the goal there. And I was a, I was a horrible choral singer because I didn't have a flexible enough technique to be able to blend very well. And I didn't have very strong concepts on, all, in, in, on any of this at the time. And I had the paresis and the extra muscle tension and all this, so I definitely didn't have what it took to really sing in choir. So I was a pretty bad choral singer, but I understand, and I did then too, that conceptually the idea is uh, they want to blend. They want you to blend with the other singers. And especially if you're a higher voice and you're going to stick out, they'll definitely want you to blend. So that's the caveat. If the choral director instructs not really any... It's because it's choral singing, it's not solo singing. But if your vocal coach says, oh, I need to hear Mimi, you're singing Mi Kiamo no Mimi, not Me Kiamo no Meme, okay? <laughs> me Kiamo no Meme, Meme. Um, hey, Meme, what's up, Meme? Like, you're not singing that, right? So uh, the, the, the coach is saying, as a soloist, you sing the words that are in the score. You sing the words, and that's what you're being paid to sing, and that's what you need to sing. And they need to hear the words they expect to hear. And they need to hear the vowels they expect to hear. And in choir, they're saying, like, let's say, I don't know, choral arrangement of me, yeah, what I mean? Gosh, that would be, that would be interesting. Um, but let's just say, you know, they're like, uh, we want you all to blend. We want you to all sound like a unified, just this nice unified sound, single person, essentially even though I feel like choirs never really sound like a single person, but it is pretty cool when they blend, right? All right, so that's the bigger picture there. So just that's the takeaway, like pedagogy tip is essentially root of the tongue and everything below that. Try to keep it as stable as you can while you sing. Should just take really deep inhale and really feel like that stuff isn't really moving very much, including your rib cage when you breathe, because those muscles of the inhalation should be helping it to stay out a bit while you're singing through your passages. And then front of the tongue, free it up. That's the idea. Keep it free and easy. And if it's not free and easy, check the root of your tongue. Are you pulling it back to over darken? Or conversely, are you putting too much subglottic pressure into your larynx and that and your and your body's like holding back you know, it has to create a higher air pressure there by pulling the tongue back. That can happen as well. So essentially, ease up the, the larynx, essentially. Make the vocal production easier. Um, and check out what you're doing there with like a lip buzz or straw or something. And then just keep it easy like that. And trust that your resonance is enough. Because it really is. It's very, very hard as a young singer to believe that resonance is enough. But it is enough. It's enough for you to carry over an orchestra, even if you're not a big voice. Um, singer's performance enough. It really, really is. So, all right, that's the big takeaway. I will see you guys next time, and I'll try to get on this and do this hopefully next week again, as long as I stay healthy, knock on everything. Oi, you guys.
told you, I work with kids a lot. I do have some voice people, but I also have kids a lot. And man, everybody's sick right now. So I'm really hoping that the cold I had is the cold that I will have for the season. And like, we're done. Washing my hands like a fiend. But because I work in such close proximity with kids, you just never know. <laughs> I was like, wash your hands all you want, but you might still get sick. So um, yeah, so hopefully that's done with that. And if I am feeling well, I will see you guys again next week. All right. Have a good one. Bye.